instead of telling uh, some jokes to get us off the ground tonight, I'll just uh, call to your attention some news items that have uh, struck me recently that I think have some bearing on my subject tonight uh, about the growth of government and the possibility that government will will not continue to grow uh, as it has uh, for a long time. Uh, the first one is from an editorial uh, in the Washington Post uh, called The Roosevelt Legacy. Uh, actually, this uh, Washington Post reminds me of, uh, of a story that uh, I was uh, told one time about the uh, CIA having discovered that uh, an enormous meteor was going to strike the Earth uh, in only a week. And, of course, because it was the CIA, uh, they were unable to keep this to themselves, and it was leaked. And so the press got hold of it, and uh, uh, the next morning, the column one uh, Wall Street Journal story, in the usual uh, uh, size type, uh, said, uh, giant meteor will destroy Earth in one week, Dow falls 200 points. And uh, that day, the USA Today uh, said, uh, giant meteor will destroy Earth in one week, uh, how we feel about it. And then it had a full color pie chart. <laughs> and the Washington Post uh, reported, uh, giant meteor will strike Earth and destroy it in one week, uh, women and minorities will suffer most. <laughs> so that tells you something about the source. Uh, of course, you all know about the source. Anyhow, you're here in the belly of the beast, almost. Uh, in uh, this editorial on the Roosevelt legacy, uh, the editorialists observed Roosevelt was truly convinced that government could do good, and he made it so. It is a sign of his achievement that so many of his policy monuments, Social Security, the Securities and Exchange Commission, Wages and Hours Laws, are virtually unassailable. And further on it says, uh, it is of course common now to declare the New Deal dead. The Roosevelt legacy, a thing of the past. And it is true that even the most ardent of the surviving New Dealers would concede that many of the programs created for the 1930s are not appropriate for the 1990s. But the Roosevelt legacy is precisely not a fixed body of doctrine. Roosevelt himself was the first to reject the dogmatic application of anyone's theories, uh, including his own. The country needs, uh, now we're quoting Roosevelt, the country needs, and unless I mistake its temper, the country demands bold, persistent experimentation, he once declared. It is common sense to take a method and try it. If it fails, admit it, frankly, and try another. But above all, try something, end quote. It is not a bad approach to government for his time or ours, says the Post. I have another uh, news item here from uh, the Post, as translated by the International Herald Tribune, reporting a poll According to the results of a national poll reduced, uh, released, uh, must have been shortly before April the 20th, this is dated, it says, uh, few Americans think that cutting federal programs will improve government performance, the poll indicated. The bureaucrats, not the problems, were not, excuse me, not the programs, were seen as government's greatest impediment. Uh, the public has not really given up on government, said Peter Hart, a pollster. When you give them a choice, they will tell you that we need better management, not necessarily smaller government. 
or giving all the responsibility to the states. The poll also showed support for the Democrats' view that government can help if properly applied. And one more item here, also from a poll, Washington Post ABC News poll. This uh, comes on May the 18th, so it's fairly recent. Since the Oklahoma City bombing, a new uh, poll suggests that Americans have rallied in defense of a much maligned target, Big Brother. Satisfaction with the federal government is up, the survey found. Anger is down. Most of those interviewed said they basically trust the federal government. A big majority said Americans are too quick to criticize. In other ways, the survey suggests that Americans are re-examining just how angry they are with their national government after seeing the tragic consequences of real rage in Oklahoma City. At the same time, the survey found narrow but deep pockets of rage and suspicion. Those questions saw government grabbing more and more of their individual rights, but a majority was willing to surrender even more personal freedom to the government to stop terrorism. And while many express deep suspicions of government, they fear the armed and anti-government militias more. Can you imagine someone who fears militias more than the federal government? Most of these people had never heard of militias four weeks ago. <laughs> Overwhelming majorities of those interviewed, including those critical of government, said private militias represent a bigger threat to their personal rights and freedoms than the federal government does. Well, I don't think I can bear to read any more of that to you. But I read these things uh, partly because perhaps you uh, tend to hang out, as I do, with people of somewhat like mind. And I think uh, in doing so, we can sometimes get a very distorted impression of what is typical of the beliefs of uh, our countrymen. Uh, uh, very distorted. Uh, I, I'm not a great believer in polls. Uh, I realize they can be uh, rigged, twisted, distorted, misinterpreted, and, and so forth. Uh, but at the same time, I, I think that they sometimes convey uh, information. And I've, I've tried to make use of them on occasion when I thought uh, I could do so reliably. And uh, when I look at polls, uh, I don't really see at any time in recent years evidence of any profound change in the typical American's attitude toward the federal government or government in general. Uh, obviously, many people are unhappy with the amount of their taxes. Uh, specific small groups of people are unhappy with specific narrowly focused types of regulation that bear on them uh, particularly hard but uh, I don't see anything in the data I've examined on public opinion that would lead me to forecast uh, any ideological revolution now I'm always prepared to be wrong. In this case, I very much hope I am wrong and that my more optimistic friends are correct. Uh, but uh, I'm withholding judgment right now. So the title that was announced for this talk, uh, Rise and Fall, with a question mark uh, of Leviathan, uh, is meant to uh, suggest that uh, I, I, I await persuasion. Uh, that something fundamental has changed. Uh, Republicans have been elected in the past. Indeed, uh, shortly after I was born, Republicans took control of the Congress after uh, 
years and years of domination by Democrats in 1946, and many people were swept away and thought that the New Deal was going to be dismantled. Nothing of the sort happened. Uh, they hardly made a dent in it. Uh, Republicans, uh, of course, came, came to control the Congress again uh, when Eisenhower was elected, and some people still, hoping against hope, thought now they'll dismantle the welfare state and the New Deal. But, of course, they did nothing of the sort then either. So I don't view the election of Republicans as, in itself, especially auspicious. Uh, Republicans have shared in the guilt for the growth of government uh, for a long, long time now. They, they've been part of the government, even though they've not often controlled it. Sometimes when I talk about the growth of government, I like to give people an impression of how much it's grown, and I, I have a number of data that I use for this. Uh, recently, I put some new ones together. And, uh, these involve taxes. I think if you've never done the arithmetic, they're quite striking. I started off by looking at uh, taxes per capita in the United States at the beginning of this century, actually 1902. At that time, per capita taxation was $22. That's federal, state, and local. Now, of course, a dollar was worth more then than it is now. About 18 times more, according to the price indices. So let's, let's make it 20. <laughs> so in today's dollars, this would be a per capita tax burden for all levels of government of about $400. Right now, uh, that is the uh, last year, 1994, the per capita tax burden in the United States was $7,665. Uh, okay, so from 400 to 7,665 in constant dollars per capita. What does that mean? I mean, that's such a big <laughs> proportional increase, it's hard to, to hold in the mind uh, to think about how much the tax burden has changed. Hmm? Well, uh, you say that's ancient history. Well, let's talk about recent times. Let's talk about, say, comparing last year with 1980, the year when Ronald Reagan's election led many of my friends to erroneously supposed that big government was about to take a beating. Many people got quite carried away, I recall vividly. They thought, our ship has come in now. Uh, the per capita tax burden in current dollar, that is today's dollars, 1994 dollars, in 1980 was $6,056. So it's, uh, it's gone up 26% in real per capita terms since Reagan was elected and, and during a period which, except for the past two years, Republicans had the White House the whole time. Not very encouraging trends, it seems to me, but I don't think that's the worst of it. Uh, I actually think that regulation has increased the burden of government in terms of depriving people of their rights and liberties uh, to an extent that uh, the data on budgets and spending and taxing uh, do not suggest at all. Now, that, that is only my hunch because there's no metric here. There's no way I can give you a common denominator, uh, but I've been a fairly active observer of the regulatory scene uh, for the past 15 years, and uh, I find it really startling uh, what has happened during that time. Uh, of course, the, the, the deregulation that was supposed to take place under Reagan didn't happen. Uh, there was a little bit of deregulation in a handful of industries, but at the same time, in other areas, the regulation in, in areas like land use at every level from county, city and county governments right on up to the federal government was becoming little short of draconian. Uh, 
environmental regulations, uh, restrictions growing out of the Endangered Species Act. Uh, one that I've worked on especially a lot in the past few years involving the Food and Drug Administration where uh, the term jackbooted thugs is perfectly applicable, uh, perfectly applicable. If these are the actions of a free government, then I am the king of Albania. Okay. Well, I don't want to just uh, whine while I'm here. Uh, let me try to give you a little different perspective on whether we can reasonably expect uh, the growth of government to be reined in, slowed down at least, uh, in the next few years. Uh, even though it has continued to grow quite rapidly up to today. And if you don't think up till today, then go get your latest issue of the Federal Register and see what's been put in there in the past week. You'll find it's bulking up at, at least to the same rate it has been for a long time. Uh, I, I think uh, if one has a decent theory of why government has grown in the past, then that theory ought to also be useful in making some forecasts about the future. That doesn't mean that it allows me to be a fortune teller because uh, history is full of uh, what economists call exogenous shocks, uh, things that aren't part of the system that's internally determinate. Uh, so we may have uh, plenty of uh, exogenous shocks uh, in the future just as we have in the past. and so. No one can predict in the social sciences the way uh, prediction can be done in physics or chemistry. And I certainly don't pretend to uh, be a predictor in that sense. But at the same time, if our explanations of past events uh, are any good at all, they should help to guide us in forming expectations about the future. Now, as Bumper mentioned, I, I have done a fair amount of research and written a book on the growth of American government from the late 19th century up to the mid-1980s. And uh, so what I'd like to do is just recall or summarize quite briefly some of the main themes of that book, uh, how I accounted for the government's growth during that time. If, if those themes are, are really productive of insight, and they should give us some clues or guides as to what to look for if government's going to, uh, to change its course in the future. Uh, one of the things that uh, I somewhat regretted about my book's uh, reception by the public was that uh, it was understood by many people as espousing the crisis hypothesis. And in a way, that's a forgivable error if you read only the title. Uh, but I, I was at some pains in the book to emphasize that it was not a mono-causal explanation and to concede that there are a variety of explanatory variables that uh, make some sense in accounting for the growth of government over that century. Uh, some of these uh, you can wrap up in, uh, in the economist notion of government responding to so-called market failures. In fact, in mainstream economics, this is about all the theory of the growth of government uh, there is. And uh, government is viewed as uh, this kind of automaton uh, that simply automatically responds uh, to take whatever actions are required to correct market failures arising from negative external uh, effects from uh, demand for public goods, which the market isn't supplying, from uh, monopoly powers being exerted in an unregulated market, and so on and so on. Uh, I won't say much about these because I, I have never been persuaded that they're very important in actually understanding why government grew. They're more like rationales or apologies uh, ex post for various government activities, but when I add them all up, they don't have much weight in the overall level of what government has been doing and doing more and more often in the past century. There are some, some kinds of government actions like, say, what the EPA does that can be plausibly connected with attempts to, to combat 
negative external effects. Uh, there are some quasi-public goods that the government supplies, and one might halfway plausibly argue that the market wouldn't have supplied them. Uh, but I don't think all of that's worth pausing too long over. In my book, I spend more time on it, but it's not important enough to belong to a summary. Another kind of explanation sometimes advanced for the growth of government is the idea that government is preeminently a redistributor of income, and over time it's become more and more so, uh, and particularly become more and more so in a pecuniary fashion. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, the federal government, particularly in this country, had the uh, great good fortune of being able to do good things for the government supporters without burdening the budget. Uh, especially it had the na national domain which it could give away. And so rather than sending grandma a check in those days it sent the, uh, the uh, Northern Pacific Railroad a land grant the size of Montana or close to it. So government was able to help a lot of its friends without having to spend a lot of money and therefore finance that spending in the 19th century. Uh, up until the Civil War, government uh, did very important things to protect the institution of slavery, which was terribly important to people who owned slave property. Uh, again, that didn't leave much of an imprint on the budget. So it's wrong, I think, to suppose that government was unimportant in the 19th century or that the United States was ever a case of laissez-faire. It wasn't. And particularly at the local level, there were always a certain amount of uh, busybody intrusions going on. Uh, and in the late 19th century, the states began to do more and more of that as well. So this was never a free market paradise, but of course, all things being relative, uh, compared to now, it was a free market paradise uh, for almost everybody except the slaves. But in the 20th century, government redistribution is increasingly taking the form of, uh, of either giving people money or giving them things that the government had to pay for uh, itself uh, and then making in-kind transfers. So. Redistributive activities have uh, become very important, and uh, in a way that's just describing one aspect of the growth of government rather than explaining it. You say, well, why, why did it become more important than before? Uh, and then we can start talking about interest group theories and about the fact that in the 20th century, many more groups got organized to lobby the government and pressure politicians to make these uh, redistributive transfers. And that probably has something to do with, among other things, the fall in costs of communication uh, and transportation, which made it far easier for people to get organized for political action uh, than it was in the 19th century with much more primitive means of communication and transportation. So uh, maybe we, we need to blame the telephone for our troubles. I know it's often uh, my woe. Connected with the increased level of redistributive activity uh, in the 20th century has been uh, an ideological change. Uh, to some extent, this is just a flip-flop. Uh, in another way, it's an ongoing change. Uh, the flip-flop took place around the beginning of this century during the progressive era. And what I think happened then was that at least among uh, opinion leaders, uh, there was a switch from a predominant allegiance to limited government to a predominant uh, preference for activist government. The progressives seem naive to us now, and maybe they, they seem that way to wise men even then. I, I know Mencken certainly had some insightful things to say about people of progressive mentality, so uh, we didn't have to wait to, to the 90s to, to see the naivete. Uh, 
but uh, the progressive ideology was one that put great faith in government's capacity to do good. It, uh, it was the precursor of what the Washington Post calls the Roosevelt legacy here uh, because it trusted government officials particularly those who weren't elected officials, but were appointed officials. They were different. They were supposedly non-political. And so if we simply appointed authoritative experts and let them do the technically correct thing, uh, then we could solve all kinds of social problems. Uh, that was a pretty silly idea then, uh, the notion that these people would be outside of politics when they were doing things that had a significant effect on society, uh, or that they would be disinterested for long. Uh, neither was the case, and of course these various progressive institutions, uh, one of which is the Food and Drug Administration, uh, have in, in, in many cases uh, developed to be thoroughly politicized. In some cases they, they were that from the very beginning. But nonetheless the ideology wouldn't die. As you can see the Washington Post editorialists are still wedded to it today. And a multitude of our, uh, our fellow Americans are still wedded to it today. The extent to which people are still prepared to believe that government can do good things for them, and almost do good things for everybody simultaneously, you know, uh, solving, sort of squaring a Bastiat circle there, that our ultimate dream being that we will all, each of us, live at the expense of the others. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the belief persists, I think, very strongly. And the, I think the post in these polls I cited correctly gauge that many people still believe that the only thing we need is better people. Different politicians, uh, different uh, people appointed to agencies, and we'll clean up the problems. They're problems of implementation. They're not problems of basic uh, institutional uh, structure. So long as people believe that, uh, they are quite predisposed to turn uh, to government for their salvation, especially when they're afraid of something. And so the last news item I mentioned is pertinent here because even uh, after an event like the bombing in Oklahoma City, uh, which uh, I don't think justified anyone's uh, suspecting a uh, that this was the beginning of an immense wave of such bombings which would endanger people all over the country but nonetheless uh, even with such a uh, an act of what uh, any Lebanese must regard as minor terrorism uh, Americans in, uh, to a large extent seem, seem to have uh, bolted uh, admitted the error of uh, suspecting there was something wrong with a huge federal government and uh, even confessed to the sin of uh, encouraging baby bombers by, uh, by condoning criticism of the government and its agents. Uh, and there's, of course, been immense back and play in the newspapers ever since on this topic of uh, affecting the climate of opinion and bearing guilt for the death of innocent children and so forth. But uh, the thing that continues to strike me is that so many people seem seriously to espouse the linkage idea that those of us who criticize uh, the government, especially the federal government, bear some guilt for the actions of, of anyone who chooses to explode a bomb in public. Uh, well, my own view is a kind of combination. I think government grew partly uh, because of the organization of interest groups to redistribute income that was connected to some extent with the adoption of progressive uh, ideology and its uh, reinforcement as a result of the Great Depression and the, uh, the, the World Wars, which encouraged many people, particularly in World War II, to think of the federal government as a very capable uh, set of actors. After all, here's the United States. Uh, we're, we're all told, almost single-handedly, defeating uh, great powers all over the world. Uh, seldom mentioned, you know, that the ratio of Soviet casualties to American is more like 40 to 1. So maybe we didn't win the war, but, uh, <clears throat> but we were on the winning side, that's for damn sure. And a lot of people came away from the war thinking uh, 
the United States' victory in World War II demonstrated that not only could the federal government uh, win a war, war, but it could organize an economy to serve that end uh, very effectively uh, in the uh, command economy that we had in 1942 through 1945. Uh, I think these crises have reinforced, at least they did up into the 1960s or so, people's long-run uh, drift toward more progressive ideological leanings. Uh, the upshot of this, by the time we get to, say, post-World War II period, is that what had been the only effective fundamental checks to the growth of government before, uh, which I think more, mainly came from the way the Constitution was understood and particularly the way it was enforced by the Supreme Court, and from even uh, more fundamentally from the reigning ideology of the country, which was suspicious of government's capabilities and suspicious of politicians' goodwill, and in many cases, particularly in the 19th century, regarded government as dangerous. Uh, all of those things are gone by 1950. So it, from that point on, the only thing that's really slowed the growth of government at all is simply partisan wrangling. It's just the fact that whenever government adopts some new measure, there are always some people who don't like it or get hurt by it, and so frequently they organize to resist it. And sometimes that resistance will be uh, effective for a while, uh, but if there are no fundamental checks, uh, they always lose sooner or later. And so what has happened is that progressively all of those battles have been lost over the last 40 years. And the net result has been a government that got bigger and bigger in every dimension, taxing, spending, regulating, and, and stomping all over traditional American rights and liberties along the way. Uh, now, if that general view of why government grew in the past is correct, what would we suspect today? Okay. Has there been any fundamental change in ideology? I don't think so. Maybe I'm wrong. If there has been, this will eventually be very important. Uh, has there been any change in the Supreme Court's view of the Constitution? No. Uh, there, was, there have been a few isolated cases of very insignificant proportion in recent years that, of course, revives all hope among lovers of liberty that the Supreme Court is going to revert to its uh, pre-1937 respect for uh, rights, uh, but these things have been so trivial that they, they amount to nothing. Uh, you know, the Lopez decision, which was written about in many places recently, uh, concerns a, a totally trivial matter. Uh, so we, we can be fully enslaved regardless of the Lopez decision. Uh, so I don't see any uh, revolution in the Supreme Court's jurisprudence. I don't see any, I'm not persuaded of any fundamental ideological change. I don't see any change in our, in our basic political institutions, uh, the way we make uh, laws in Congress and, and uh, the provisions of our, our Constitution uh, for holding elections or setting agendas or whatnot. Uh, I just don't see any reason to expect anything but more of the same right now. And, and I would love to be proven wrong by events, especially by events, more than by any of you. But uh, I think I've said enough to perhaps uh, irritate you. And I, so I'll stop talking here. And if, uh, if you'd like to pose a question to me or the rest of the people, uh, I think we've got... Time for that bump.